Hey everybody, welcome to this week's uh, Google Plus Platform Office Hours. I am joined by Richard Dunn, who's the tech lead for Google Plus Hangouts, as well as uh, Jason Salas and uh, the one and only Alan Persenberg. Hey everybody. Oh, and, and Jenny Murphy's coming on stage right now. Ah, there she is. <laughs> so, uh, I th first and foremost, I want to um, thank Richard for joining us this week. It's, a, it's an honor to have one of the members of the Hangouts API team um, join this office hours. Uh, as busy as, you know, we're trying to get more releases out as, as often as we can. Um, uh, we have a few questions for him to answer later in the show, as well as uh, questions from um, the folks who joined us. Uh, I think for, for this office hour, it's going to be a little more freeform. Um, and as questions come in, we'll, we'll start, to, uh, start to address those, um, not, not a particular topic to, to start with. Um, so how about I just start with Richard saying, uh, What's uh, what's going on with Hangouts API? What's what's the current state of things? And and what would you like to tell the audience first? Um, yeah. So hi guys, I'm Richard, uh, tech lead for Hangouts API. Um, I assume most people are aware that we launched publicly uh, just about a month ago. Uh, so we're really excited to have stuff out there and see people, um, uh, you know, building apps, uh, releasing apps. Uh, we're interested to see what what can happen. Um, we spent a lot of time sort of getting that public release going, so we're now being able to have some time to go back and uh, beef up the API some more. Um, so we're also interested in hearing from people, you know, what, what do you need uh, for us to build for you? Um, trying to make it easier to write apps, that kind of thing. Uh, so easier to to write apps, easier to distribute apps, uh, easier to find and use apps in the Hangout, uh, all that kind of stuff is, is things that we're thinking about and working on. Great. Very cool. <laughs> um, so for, the, uh, for Jason, uh, I think you're, are you, is this your first time in our office hours? Uh, yeah, I, I, I actually normally, because of the uh, time difference between uh, you find folks and me and everything, I usually catch it on demand, but um, I was really interested in participating today just because the focus is going to be specifically on the Hangouts API, which like Alan, I have taken a great interest in and, you know, like done a fair amount of tinkering in. Um, and I actually, the, like I'm trying to get several uh, Hangouts API-centric projects off the ground and everything like that. So I'm really excited to be uh, speaking with you and Jenny and Richard. All, all, of, all of you have um, been extremely gracious and, and really, really uh, quick to respond in the past and everything, every time we have quick questions and everything. So it's a uh, it's a real treat to be interacting with you guys live this time. And so, it's 4.30 uh, four four thirty in the morning on Thursday from where <laughs> I am right now. Uh, and you mentioned Even though you got a second you're, not, uh, you're not in the state, you're not stateside. Where are you again? Uh, I'm in Guam. So we, I, I am about three and a half hours south of Japan and eight and a half hours north of Hawaii. Nice. Uh, and 15, well, hours ahead, 15 hours ahead of you guys. <laughs> so you're literally talking to somebody from your future. Oh, how, how is it in the future? Is that my <laughs> It's, it's hot. It's hot here. It's very, very hot. It's 4.30 4 in the morning, and it's about 89 degrees already. So uh, can you talk a little bit about some of the projects you're thinking about doing? I've, I feel like I've, oh, okay. I've seen you around on, on Twitter, but, um, yeah, it'd be great to hear about them. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Twitter, it's uh, lot, lots of uh, sports one-liners and everything, but uh, hopefully something a little bit more, uh, <laughs> with a little bit more uh, substance here. So basically, I know... You know, I, I kind of had, and this obviously is not a completely new idea, but I was talking with some friends in a Hangout and, you know, like on my stream, and, and I just kind of thought, I was like, you know, why isn't there a Hangout app right now that lets paid Netflix subscribers be able to actually basically like host movie parties? And, you know, I kind of came up with, came up with the notion that, you know, movie, movie watching and the, the act of enjoying movies can be a social experience if you so desire. Uh, you know, for some people, they're very private relaxation activities and for other people they're more of a party atmosphere and so I started thinking about it and I was like you know if you're a paid Netflix subscriber you should be able to share those kind of experiences with other Netflix subscribers and I know you know obviously there's a whole bunch of intellectual property concerns and there's uh, huge issues about you know is that going to be uh, piracy and can you lock it down so that you know movies don't get stolen and everything like that but I actually started thinking and I was like 
Um, I started looking at other platforms, and of course on the Xbox 360, they, they previously had a party mode where if you were a legitimate Netflix subscriber, you and other members could sign in, and then you could basically watch a movie together. And um, up until the December 2011 firmware update, I believe, uh, that existed, but it's since been taken out. So I was thinking, can this thing, can this kind of thing be actually be built legally and safely and securely um, with the Hangouts uh, platform and everything? And you know, I, I would think that it could be. Um, so I guess, long story short, now that I've rambled on, um, as a developer, uh, how, what kind of control do I have to say, like, if, if I build an app and everything, to ensure that it will not work in a Hangout on Air scenario, like it regardless of, the, of if in this implementation or something else and everything like that, if I write something, is there a guarantee or do I have programmatic control to say, like, this will not run in a Hangout on Air, in a live broadcast? Um, we don't have that right now, and I think that um, as part of preparing for a, a broader release of the on Air stuff, um, there's actually a bunch of things we need to do um, to just make sure everything works great. And I, th I guess one of the obvious things will be um, should this app be able to run in, in an on-air? I don't think that's something we thought about. We thought about more. Like, as an example, uh, I have the volume control app up, and there's six participants, not five, because there's the magic, like, on-air <laughs> participant. So we should probably be fixing that. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a good point. Um, I, I don't know if you'd want to do it, like, uh, you know, don't ever let this run, so like, don't even show this in a Hangout on Air, or whether you just want to let the application know, hey, this is an on Air Hangout, and then the application can decide like, to show something where it's like, this, this is not available in an on Air. I, I think there are also some you, you know, because right now I know, and Alan and I um, are contributors to Google Plus Week. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, I was, I was, I'm sorry, Alan. I was going to say, you know, because, because you and I are both contributors to Google Plus Week, and, um, and Dan McDermott, the show host on that show, has, you know, of time, has of time said, you know, if I bring up a Google Doc and everything because I want to, you know, interact with the guests and everything, that's not going to show up, I guess, just by default uh, because it won't come out in the recording. Right, right, I was like, right. You know, yeah. yeah, like you were saying, Richard, I mean, hopefully in the future, it, either by design of the actual core program or maybe from a, develop, a, a developer standpoint and everything, this will just be something that we can... Uh, maybe just eat, like easily like a flag, just like turn on or off, and just say like you know exclude this from uh, from a live broadcast scenario, either because you know it's just going to be goofy, or just because you know there are privacy concerns or you know whatever. Right, right. And, and again, it's not as big of a problem now, just because the apps aren't aren't available, like they're not going to show up on the recording. But I think that's obviously a place that we want to get to. Yeah, and so I, you I think have to have this. I think one of the things that we need to start evolving towards when we're talking about the integration of apps and on air is a way for some of the apps to be able to control, for, for the, um, the person who owns the on-air account to be able to control the, the recording hidden user. Right, right. right. So, oh, so, you know, for now, for example, I know that if, uh, if that person clicks on uh, one of the thumbnails in the bottom, that will be the primary uh, stream that's recorded mm -hmm. and that, that's sent out on-air. That kind of control in an API fashion would also be beneficial. And I'm sure there are others. But right. It's, it's that sort of thing. Right. So, so as I said, we definitely have an open, sort of an open project to do the on-air stuff. And, and there is definitely a plan to say, uh, to expose the sort of privileges that the broadcaster has, um, you know, like I think kick and that kind of thing, as an API so that people can write. I mean, ideally, we will want to, you know, people to be able to write an extension or whatever that's a better version of, like, the broadcast controls. Um, and that extension would be aware that, hey, this person is, you know, the broadcaster and I can actually do this. And if they're not the broadcaster and they try to do it, it's just, it, it will just fail on them. Um, but, but we definitely do want to expose that, and we would just expose that in the way of, you know, there will obviously be a call that's like, is this person the broadcaster? And if they are, you have all these other calls available to you. Mm -hmm. And I would say that uh, as you guys are thinking about how that would work, um, as developers and designers of that, the feedback to us directly, even though you do it already, anybody who's on, uh, um, watching this live or the recording, uh, send it our way, uh, both to Jenny and I and the rest of the team, um, and, and we can bubble that up and, and, and help that with the, the API side. Mm -hmm. Definitely. 
Uh, okay. Well, I, I had another question, if I if I may, uh, for for Richard and actually for yeah for all of you, including uh, Alan. Um, I know one of my favorite examples is the very excellent demo that uh, Jonathan has actually showed many times live uh, in his presentations. The one where, um, like you know, you have the little avatars of each participant, and then he goes mm -hmm. around and like the the initial version of that I think Wolf may have written it yep. specifically, but you know, like takes a drink or dances around, you know, mm -hmm. grabs a candy bar, and the most recent one was. Right. Um, you know, flies and, you know, gets out of there to actually get down to South by Southwest. Yeah. And Jonathan, you actually mentioned that there was, uh, because it's built in Flash, that there was a communications bridge that was very easy to do. Um, again, because, like, what I'm looking at doing right now is hopefully trying to uh, integrate Netflix, which I believe for most people is based on Silverlight. So do, do you know, because I, I'm just ignorant to that thing, do you know if there is a Flash-like bridge that we can use to communicate with Silverlight uh, applications? Yeah, so... Um in Flash, uh, there's a series of methods that's called external interface so that allows you to call uh, JavaScript externally, and there's a way to, to do the reverse um, from Flash to, um, to pass that back up. Uh, Silverlight has a similar API. Uh, I don't know it. I've never programmed Silverlight, but I know if you Google external interface Silverlight, you'll find the right path um, probably through Stack Overflow, if I were to guess, um, and you could also um, send you that after the, after the show. All right, excellent. Thank you. No, no problem. Cool. So are there any more, any other questions for people currently present? <laughs> Otherwise, I'll start going to the <laughs> comments feed, uh, and we'll answer some live questions from the passive audience who are watching us on YouTube or on um, Google+. Uh, well, if, if yeah. I... Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry, if I, I was going to say, if I can just be a motor mouth for just uh, ten, 10 more seconds. Um, one other concern I had, um, and it's kind of a minor one, was um, because I've done some HTML5 work as far as uh, video game development, and like developers have in that space is kind of a concern for, because we're now, you know, we can actually list our applications and extensions in the Chrome Web Store, and for those people that actually want to, you know, maybe commercialize this, is there a way as developers where we could actually maybe obfuscate the code that we ultimately write so that, you know, it won't be so easy to, you know, just go in and kind of, like, look through and see what, what we're doing or, you know, in, in some way kind of, like, actually lock down the logic just so it, it's not so easy to reverse engineer what we're doing. Right. Um, I mean, there's there's a variety of ways to compile, in, in some sense, JavaScript. Um, obviously, Google's closure stuff has ways to compile it down. Um, like, if you look at the actual Hangouts code, it's... If you were really into it, you could probably figure out what it was doing, but it, it just makes it, you know, it, it increases that bar so much further. Um, you know, in general, we haven't been facing that situation because the apps that we've been writing are sort of like, we'd like you to see them and how we do things, mm -hmm. but um, there, there are definitely solutions that, that compile it down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, which I, I'd add to that. Um, Closure Compile is great. Uh, we use it uh, across Google. Um, there's a recent addition to Chrome, which makes using that not only better for a developer, but also, you know, still sane. Uh, it's called um, Source Maps. Um, and what that does is you compile it, your JavaScript code, it obfuscates it and, and try to reduce the complexity of it. And then it also spits out this file called Source Map. Um, it's sort of like your um, Rosetta Stone for your obfuscated code. So all you have to do is plug that into Chrome, <laughs> and then your code gets cleaned up and um, legible again. Yeah, unobfuscated. <laughs> so if you have access right, to the source map, you can actually, it looks clean to you. Um, so that's a super powerful tool um, when you want to try to develop it. Oh, excellent. Yeah, and, and I was actually thinking more from the, from the standpoint of people who might use uh, apps that we write, not necessarily because, you know, like, because I want to mangle my own code just so people won't be able to, you know, reverse engineer it. I'm just thinking, you know, how easy would it be for somebody to go in there and actually like pick apart what I'm doing? Because yeah, like you know, like you guys right now, it's you know, it's a great learning tool. So the the two things I will say about um, game development, it's, uh, it's a little bit tricky because uh, if you're building a web app that people want to use because utility, they're not going to hack around. Um, but in games, uh, people there's Murphy's law that says they will hack the game to try to get a better score. Uh, so there's there's a you know, very long and, you know, detailed science of how to uh, try to prevent that um, with states and using the servers and things like that. So it's not just up, um, on obfuscating your code, 
but also trying to um, ensure um, truthfulness in the state of your application. So that's where uh, using a server-side uh, backend to store that and keep that truthy, as well as you know, obfuscating the data over the wire and things like that. So just an extra um, tip. All right, thank you. No problem. Cool. Okay, now, so I'm going to pull a question from the, the comment stream now. So Kim uh, actually asked a few questions. Uh, I'll read them one at a time and we'll field them one, one at a time. So first she asks, um, I have Hangouts on Air Plus live streaming to YouTube capability and I would like to ask questions live. Here's my question. When will the chat stream be incorporated into the Hangout so that it can be monitored within the Hangout? Uh, I'm, I'm assuming she's asking about the, the YouTube um, chat stream. Also, is there a plan to incorporate the chat? Oh, there it is. Is there a plan to incorporate the chat from YouTube um, to it too, so that it can be managed from within the Hangout on air? So um, I guess what she's asking is right now there's a whole bunch of different conversation channels potentially for a Hangout on air, like the Hangout on air you might be watching right now. Um, are there any plans to kind of coalesce the, those um, communication channels? So, so, sorry, you were talking about like the YouTube chat? So I, I think your question is, you know, I, I start uh, on air and there's a post and people comment mm -hmm. in that post. Um, I'd like to see those comments inside of the chat. Also, I have a YouTube Live and there's, a, there's comments there. Uh, people reshare those posts, there's comments there. Um, it's hard, right. to, hard for to manage them in, in these multiple interfaces. Got it, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, in terms of the post thing, I, chat's sort of, like, putting it into the chat and the Hangout is sort of a delicate topic. Um, we have talked in the past about doing, like, a right interface to the chat. Um, you know, because things like, maintaining the event history of, of an app or whatever, um, you know, like so-and-so changed the YouTube video to something. Um, getting, like, read access to the chat is, like, super sensitive in terms of privacy issues. <clears throat> the other thing that people, I think, are a little worried about is is sort of filling up that chat with useless stuff. Um, but we would definitely like to, to find a way to let apps right into it. And then I think if you can let apps right into the chat stream, then whatever the app can access in terms of, um, you know, Google Plus post, the, the, the comments tracker would be an example here, right, where it knows the post and can access those comments and it could put them into the chat. Um, and then I assume there's a YouTube API for grabbing the comments around a particular video. Um, and, then it, and then it's really just an implementation issue. So I think the takeaway from that is API-wise, we really do need to find a way to either integrate that into the chat stream or have a separate stream that's like app events and that, and that kind of thing that people can follow. Um, and so for anybody who's, uh, who's not familiar with Comment Tracker, that was a Hangout extension that was built by Gerwin Strom. Uh, it allows you to grab any post on Google+, paste the URL for that post into the sidebar extension, um, and it will actually pull in all the comments. So in this particular Hangout, if you want to track the post, we could follow along and, and pull in those questions. Um, right. And it's one of the, the many uh, Hangout apps that we have built by third parties. Cool. So we have some other questions uh, that are not directly related to the Hangouts API um, or more Hangouts in general questions. Let me reload. For example, there's one question. Um, when will Hangouts on Air come to Android? Which I guess is a question about running a Hangout on air from um, a mobile device. Um, that is an interesting question. <laughs> I don't actually know how tough that would be to do. Um, yeah, I, I, I think the, I the, the sh part of the answer is that won't happen until Hangouts on air gets um, uh, obviously right. Uh, and if, at that point, if, if it's feasible, that's something to look at, but there's, there's no plans um, as far as you know, and right. that's a great right. idea. Right? It's a cool idea. I, I, I think in general we'd like to, to make the mobile experience as rich as possible, um, and so being able to support all that is, is definitely something we'd like to work on. Cool. So next up... Or we have maybe, a maybe even, Sorry. even as a participant? 
Sorry, you broke up a little in the middle there. What did what'd you say? Oh, did I, I, I'm, so, I'm sorry about that. Maybe the person's even asking as a, as a participant, because like, I'm fortunate enough to have Hangouts on Air access, but uh, when my friends invite me with other Hangouts on Air, um, users invite me to, uh, to Hangouts, and if they're going on the air, then you know, like if I check it on, my, on one of my mobile devices, it says, you know, uh, this is not supported, obviously, by, uh, by mobile devices. So maybe that person's even thinking, you know, can, I, can I at least jump in, uh, if not as a, as a recorder, then as a, just as a uh, contributor. Yeah, I mean, I, I, that's something definitely for me to check with the on-air team, um, who, who is a separate team than I am, but I, I'm actually a little surprised that you can't join us to, as a participant. Um, but that, that seems like it would be a much easier task to accomplish. Okay, so I have a question from Robert Pitt. Okay. When will the OAuth token be easily accessible within the API? Right now, users authorize the applications, but there is um, no method to get the access token within the code. Uh, so, Jonathan, I, th I thought Wolf published a sample app that, that was showing you how to get the OAuth token. Yeah, so the, the, with the current implementation, uh, they authorize it, and then you could use the JavaScript client library to access that token. Uh, it is part of our Hangout experiments. Um, which is a, just a, a code repository. It's, I don't know if we linked to it from the developer site just yet, but um, oh, okay. it's easily available. And we, I think I even demoed that uh, three office hours ago. Um, so uh, if not, we can, we can post that link to the article on describing how to use it. Uh, it works well. Um, we have, I think, uh, for example, Pokers, uh, Aces Poker is using it in, in, their, uh, in their app, mm -hmm. and that lets you use the Google APIs and that includes Google Plus and every other um, authenticated API under that under the Google stack. So, right. It is yeah, good. I mean, I, I think we should definitely um, uh, hook that up to the developer side if possible. Yeah, and and we are looking at ways to streamline that even further and make it uh, make it a better developer experience. But in the meantime, <coughs> I will um, we'll, we'll grab that article from Wolf um, and I will add it to the show notes. Um, near this question, so Great. add another way for people to find it. <laughs> Great. So I've got a follow-up question on uh, on one of the um, the mobile questions from earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of plans are in progress for having Hangout apps available through the mobile clients? So we've we've definitely thought about it, um, and it, it actually turns out to be. Something of a hard problem, just because there's not a lot of there's not a lot of support for JavaScript in the sort of mobile native apps, um, and it's it's really hard to sort of get that that communication going. Um, so there are some plans to to look at it from a different way, um, but nothing that I think is going to come out anytime soon. That's interesting because I mean there's there's a lot of stuff on mobile that's being done with a, a WebKit window. Right. So I, from my understanding, it's the communication It's the communication that seems to be the problem. So, the, the, so you know, displaying that is fine, but the communication across that, that you know, WebKit window to the actual native app is, is and, and, you know, we have a fairly rich API that, that sort of relies on a lot of that communication. Um, you know, like we might be able to do a scaled down version of it, um, but that, that was my understanding of, of sort of the, the technical difficulty there. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Great. And I will add that uh, the WebKit uh, inner child, uh, child iframe across different um, operating systems, as well as different versions of operating systems, is not consistent. Very inconsistent. Mm -hmm. so. We, as I said, like as a general as a general rule, we're trying to make the mobile experience as rich as possible, and we certainly have that on our, you know, to do list. Um, it's just given given the technical constraints and then resource constraints, it's probably going to be a while. Great. So I'm not seeing any other Hangouts API related questions, but I am seeing a couple questions about. Um, the show and uh, the REST API. So I'll, I'll field these really quickly while um, wait for those of you out there to ask us some more questions about the Hangouts API. 
So Fabio asks, is it possible to search for two or more hashtags using the activities.search method? I'm actually, and I just did some experimentation with it, and based, I got the same results you did. When searching for multiple hashtags, the results just did full text search using the hashtags. So right now it appears that it only accepts one hashtag, as well as any number of full text um, search parameters. I'm a little surprised by that, so I'll be following up. I'll be filing that um, as as a bug, and I'll follow up with you with you know with you later on that. So I would expect that to work. Thanks for bringing that to our attention. And and also, uh, Niccolo asks, will we be treated to? Um, PHP for list activities. I'm assuming you're referring to the JavaScript demo I did last session uh, of showing you how to use um, the JavaScript APIs and the JavaScript client library to access your activities. Um, not going to be doing that in PHP today. We're focusing on Hangout APIs. But um, in a future week, we'll be talking about that. So thanks for your patience. May I ask another question? Yeah, please. Yeah, um, I was I was wondering, and this you know this may may or may not be anything, but um, and I think it maybe goes more to the to the uh, to the core REST API, and I be I don't believe it exists right now. But would we be able to actually set which uh, what what level of of invitee would be uh, would be able to get either the Hangout app or, you know, like be invited to actually use that app. And this, this is a weird weird way of framing it. I, got, I, I guess I got to rephrase. Like, would I be able to only invite um, non-public circles or non, you know, extended circles to use an app? Like, say, you know, if you just wanted to do it for like a super private, um, uh, like a super private implementation or only invite, you know, um, specific non-public circles or individual users. So... I mean, you should probably just do it manually. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess I'm confused as to why. I mean, are you, are there concerns above and beyond like creating a hangout with this app and then only inviting those select few people? Yeah, like for for just some, uh, I guess because like again, you know, going back to what uh, what I was trying to do with Netflix initially, I was saying it's like okay, well, um, you know, I only want to invite certain people and I don't want to open it up to the greater internet. In general and everything, so can, you know, can I exclude this from ever being um, a service that people would invite to public and everything? And then I just kind of came around. I was like, you know what? Why do I shouldn't even bother with that? Just make sure that everybody using it is a subscriber of that service, and that takes care of that whole problem. But well, you know, yeah. just going back to that and everything, would it ever be possible just to? There's also another solution. Um, you know, if you don't publish this app, if you keep it private. Um, right. and add individuals as team members of that application, they'll still be able okay. to use that application and won't be publicly available. Right. So that might be another solution, especially if this is like a small app for your team or your school um, or something you're in development. Uh, that's that's the, the right route. Okay. Thank you. Yep. And that's the, if you're, uh, if you're, if any of you did Hangout app development before the release, that's actually the original solution for collaborating right. on, on the right. Hangout app. And I, and I might add something, which is that we're trying to um, we're going to try to remove this distinction between sort of public hangouts and then the the developer sandbox, and actually try to roll that into the main thing, so that you can create, so that you can join a hangout in in developer mode if you are a developer and look at your developed apps and your private apps and things like that, but that it's not necessarily a separate hangout, um, and so you you could invite other people to that hangout, they wouldn't necessarily be able to see your private apps. Um, but but just, just try to integrate that experience and not have this this sort of separate sandboxed environment. Yeah, because um, the, 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 the Oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say, Jason, the way I deal with that right now is uh, for, for all of my apps, I essentially have two projects. One is the release project and one is the development project. Mm -hmm. and I either don't invite or on a very limited basis invite people into the Hangout while I'm doing development. Mm -hmm. So if, uh, if you catch me at the right time, you'll see my caption test app running. And for the most part, you won't. You can also do um, you know, user authentication on top of your application. So right. if you have you know, an app engine, right. um, app running, you can look at the uh, logged in user and just show a white screen or you don't have access to it if, if they're not authorized. So. Right, because you can use the, essentially their, their 
Google Plus ID to uniquely identify them. Yep. Cool. So I have a more general Hangouts question for you, Jonathan. Oh, Matthew Books asks, how do you host a Hangout that is simulcast on YouTube? Uh, so the, what we're in right now is a Hangouts on Air, and that is a product that has been in um, limited availability um, as we're building out the infrastructure and the technology. And, and what that allows you to do is take a regular Hangout, uh, flip a bit, and we automatically publish that to Google Plus as a YouTube live stream, and it lives on um, YouTube.com. Uh, that feature is not yet generally available, but we're planning on rolling out um, soon. Uh, there is, if you want more specific questions, there's an FAQ on the help site that talks a little bit more about that, um, and you know, just follow along uh, when that becomes more readily available. Great. Well, looks like that's all we have on the feed for today. So, does anyone uh, who's joined us have anything else they'd like to discuss? Yeah, I actually had a, a general question. Um, in some ways, it's kind of basic. From reading the API, if I remember correctly, um, getting the list of users in the Hangout, mm -hmm. although you, you do get a list of people, anyone who's not running your app doesn't get, uh, anyone who's not running your app just shows up as there, but with no information at all about them. Right. Um, so, so that was actually um, originally a policy decision, sort of, from a privacy perspective, um, but, and I think this is something that came out of the public launch. Um, there are definitely use cases for having that stuff. I mean, I think the volume app is a good indication of that, right? It's like, not, you shouldn't have to have everyone run this app, but I should be able to find out this information. Um, I, I think as of today, we're actually revisiting that decision, um, and so you should expect to see that, that opened up. Okay, um, I think there, there are at least some it seems to me there's some pieces of information that might be useful. So even if I don't have, for example, their um, their ID number, right, um, it might still be useful to at least have their name, so right, I know right. who they are. So I, I think we're I think we're definitely comfortable with doing the name and the image um, because they're they're part of that. And I think the reality is is that that will probably mean the ID will be public because if you have a name and an image you're going to be able to find their ID, <laughs> right? I mean, if, if you were, if, we're, we're, we're definitely going to make the name and the image public. Um, and that, that should be coming very soon. Um, let me also ask a question. This may be for, um, I'm not sure if this is, is great for you or for the, the, the team. Um, what are current best practices on uh, storing configuration information long term? It's something I've been thinking about a lot for the past week or so, and I've got assorted ideas, and all of them have their pluses and minuses. So I'm curious what, what current suggestions for best practice would be. So maybe you can elaborate on the type of configuration, or give an example of what kind of data you're storing, and then we could, you know. Um, in pretty much what I'm thinking of at this point is just uh, storing a, a JSON object, nothing large, extremely tiny, probably something that could fit into uh, a cookie or into a local storage, but for various reasons, I don't want to put it in there. Um, so we're talking something that's probably 1K or less. Um, I kind of Some of it is may or may not be somewhat sensitive, so I want to at least be able to assure the person who's doing the configuration that I will never have, I as the app developer, won't have access to it. So I'm... So can you give me an example of two bits of data, one sensitive, one not sensitive, and then I can... Maybe think a little bit more about it. I have a um, bunch of options there, but yeah, using for example, a caption app. You know, my my caption app. Just uh, a a, a non-sensitive one would just be uh, predefine a bunch of caption configurations and be able to quickly switch between them without having to change the settings every time. Or giving my preferential colors so those show up at the top of the list. Um, those would be examples of non-sensitive stuff. Uh, more sensitive stuff is, in some cases, the captions themselves could be, or if I'm using Hangouts to share pictures, what the references to those pictures might be. Um, the sensitive one is probably not so much, uh, it's, it's not as fully formed, but I can see apps where in the future I would be storing more sensitive information in there that, you know, even if 
uh, it's not critically private, I don't want the person thinking, hey, wait a minute, what other information does this person have about me? So uh, you mentioned a few good ones. Obviously, cookie storage is one. Uh, local storage is another. There's also session storage, which gets deleted after the session's over, which is very similar to local storage in that sense. Um, there is, of course, server-side storage, right? You can persist that in your database and, you know, with your privacy policy, um, promise the user that you're going to encrypt that or, you know, delete it every 24 hours, something like that. Um, in terms of encryption, uh, both in the local storage or browser-based storage as well as server-side storage, there's a couple of interesting techniques. Um, hashing data is one. Right, that's simple enough. Mm -hmm. Especially, you can hash the 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 values of the JSON. There's also um, JSON Web Tokens, uh, yeah, uh, or Jocks, um, which is uh, basically encrypted um, JSON with a standard. Uh, we use that in a few places, like in in app payments and things like that. Um, if you really want the data stored client side and to persist across sessions. I mean, the, really, the only viable solution I think is is encrypted local storage. Um, maybe um, Jot um, is is one solution for you for that. Uh, okay. Let me let me raise the let me raise the possibility that this be a possible API extension in the future, being able to provide a a small chunk of configuration space. Yeah. So we we have we have definitely thought about providing um, some sort of persistent storage. Um, uh, you know, I, I think in general we're trying, you know, when it comes to data, we're trying to provide sort of a basic API that will work for most small applications and then anyone that, that wants to write something big rolls their own. And obviously persistence is one of those things that, that is an issue. Um, I think mostly we haven't addressed it yet because it's unclear, like, should this be charged to the user, should this be charged to the app, that, that kind of thing. Like, how, how do we... How do we resolve that piece of it? Um, but it's definitely on the sort of medium to long term goals. Um, okay. In the meantime, obviously, there's there's all these solutions that that Jonathan has talked about. Um, and uh, just to touch on the server side piece, uh, if it's something that the user needs to change often, um, obviously uh, App Engine and BigQuery and the different types of ways to um, persist data is one solution. If it's a configuration that doesn't change often, let's say at uh, you know startup or their profile information, that could be something you could even store on um, Google Cloud Storage uh, as, a, as a simple JSON file. Um, all that stuff can be encrypted um, over the wire as well as uh, where you store it. So um, it's another thing to look at. And I just I just had a quick uh, quick two part question and maybe this is more promotional than anything. Um, so so real fast uh, double edged sword here. Um, one have you have you heard about any app developers building anything that facilitate in app payment, not necessarily to use the app, but actually running the app where you can facilitate uh, uh, payment transactions. And then two, even though we've only been out for a few weeks as far as the Hangout API being officially in a 1.0 release. Have you heard about anybody writing any books about the topic? Uh, so in terms of charging, uh, before we had Hangout apps, there was Chef's Hangouts, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a service that uh, allows people to pay to learn how to cook. Um, and they're doing some very interesting things. I know they're looking at Hangout apps. Um, there are, I, I believe, uh, some of the initial uh, apps that came out with launch either have payments already or are looking to, to payments. Uh, obviously, Google has in-app payments. Um, we, have an, we don't have a sample working with it, uh, mm -hmm. but it should be feasible to work. Um, and uh, it's probably a good solution, especially with the, the price point. Um, so actually, our, our PM's previous project was in-app payments. So <laughs> we should probably get him on that task. Uh, but yeah, it, it should work. Uh, and uh, obviously, because it's so new, nobody's written any books. I don't know anybody's writing a books about specifically about payments in Hangout apps. Or just just or about just book, books about Hangout Hangout apps in general. Right. I, I would I would assume that there's a, there's a ton of people just lining up to say like you know hey I can do I can do a really good title on that. I mean, it's a fascinating topic to write to write a to write a book on. And it is a, it is a fast-moving target, so it's probably right. one of the reasons why it hasn't been um, 
I'll off it yet. Uh, but it, it definitely just Google Plus in general on the platform. It is, there's a lot of interesting things and, and new approaches to, to social web um, and social platforms that I think uh, would make up that. Maybe I'll cut out early and go write a book. <laughs> <laughs> or you can do it in uh, Google Docs and do it in a Hangout. There you go. There you <laughs> and go. Then, you, then you can use in-app payment and actually charge people. <laughs> well, we, uh, we, you know, with the launch of Google Drive, just to sign up, we, uh, we partnered with Lulu, so you can do publishing straight from Google Docs. There you go. Hey. Right. Right. Every, every, every promotional Alan, engine. Oh, sorry. I see Alan made a comment about G Drive as well. Great. <laughs> I, would, I would love to see a Hangout app, actually, that, um, that did use the G Drive API. So that'd be great. Let's do it. Yeah. Cool. I actually did see some questions uh, before Google Drive came out uh, about the Doclist API. Um, and just to make a quick comment, Doclist API is not part of the Google um, API stack, so it doesn't use any. It cannot be work with our Google client APIs, um, but uh, it is using the old uh, G Data implementation, which has plenty of sample code and APIs. I believe there's even a JavaScript uh, client library for GData, so you could use it straight, uh, straight in Hangouts. Excellent. Yeah. Okay, yeah. well, um, unless there are any other questions, I don't see anything else in the feed. We're getting close to our end of the uh, scheduled end time. So if you have any questions, speak now or wait until the next session. Okie doke. So I think we're going to call it a day then. So thanks Great. to everyone who joined us uh, and everyone who commented on the thread, participated in other ways. Um, and that's it. So we're going to be taking off. See you All later. Right. Bye, everyone. Thank you, guys. Bye. Bye-bye.